Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our live webinar talking about the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. Uh, one of the things that we do specialize in here at Independence Title, we have several partners that are on the tax side, on the paperwork side, and obviously we are on the closing side. And today we have an amazing training. As I said earlier, we are going to have uh, a series of five trainings coming up every Friday, 2 p.m. for the next five weeks. You can check our Facebook page. We are recording this webinar so we can send it to you. And it's also streaming live on our uh, Facebook page and our Facebook group uh, as well. So again, welcome. Today we have a fantastic trainer coming on. Uh, we're going to have Karen Michael. She works with one of our national partners, Fidelity. Uh, and she's going to be doing this five series training over the next couple of weeks on a bunch of different topics. So this is one of the ones that I know a lot of people asked for. So we wanted to bring it to you first. So Karen, take it over. Awesome, thank you so much, Kevin. So yes, everyone, we're gonna talk about Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. Um, I'm just gonna throw up right away my disclaimer <laughs> because this is such a specialized area of tax law that I, I'm an attorney, but I do real estate. This is something that you know when we're talking about it, i'm going to give you a general overview of it if you have specific questions that's where you can reach out to kevin kevin can set you up with somebody um that does FERPTA. because the other thing is there's a lot of cpas there's a lot of tax attorneys out there that know nothing about this and if you go to the wrong one we have problems so there are FERPTA specific cpas and tax attorneys that we rely on for information so the information i'm giving you today like i said a general overview so you get an understanding of kind of what it is, why we're do, asking these questions, you know, at closing or before closing about foreign nationals. And then, you know, just a side note, you as a realtor never, ever, ever want to give legal advice on this, pretty much anything else, but it's specifically this. This is, um, like I said, there's a lot of nuances and, you know, for me to even go through the details, you might have a question and it really is, it's going to go to a tax attorney. So I'm just putting up my disclaimer right now that we're not representing that we are FERP to tax attorneys. We're just giving you a general overview. So that's my little disclaimer for all of you. And you will get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, Kevin. I'll send it over to you if you want to um, send it out to everyone. Okay. So, so what is the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act? Just briefly, it was enacted back in uh, 1980 by Congress, amended a couple times. Uh, they increased the withholdings in 2015. And basically what it is, the United States government, IRS was like, hey, foreign nationals are going back to their homeland and not paying taxes. We need to be able to collect taxes. So they created the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. It all centers around this thing called the withholding. So under FERPTA, if you are going to sell a property as a foreign national, the IRS says, okay, you're going to owe taxes. You may owe taxes. So what we're going to do is we are going to do this thing called a withholding. I like to think of it as a t an escrow for any taxes the seller may owe to the IRS. So that's the easiest way to explain it in our closing world is a tax escrow. Um, it's not the actual tax. Like I said, just a tax escrow. So it's a pay, the withholding is the payment towards the tax obligation the foreign person or entity may have to the IRS. That's all it is. We don't know what the, the taxes are at this point, so we're gonna withhold a certain percentage based on the FERP to laws. The seller still has to file a U.S. tax return or pay any taxes due. So even if the withholding, you know, we withheld a certain amount and they still owe more money, they're going to still have to pay those taxes in addition to that. Um, but they still have to file that U.S. tax return. If the actual tax is less than the withholding, they can get a refund. There may even not even be any money due and owing, and then we don't have to do withholding. But we're going to review all of it. But that's what the withholding is. Just keep in mind that it's collected at closing. It's essentially a tax escrow for anything the seller may do be um, owe the IRS. Excuse me. So there are some exceptions to this, but generally it's 15% of the sales price. It's not the net proceeds. So if it's a short sale and the seller has to bring in money for the withholding, it's 15% of the sales price. So if they're only getting $1,000 back on a $100,000 house, they, 
they still have to bring in that 15% um, in addition to, you know, whatever else they have to bring in. It, yeah, 15% whether they take a realize a gain or take a loss, doesn't matter. It's that withholding is that tax escrow because they still may owe taxes and the IRS at the end of the day would like to get paid. One of the things we're going to talk about as an exception is the, um, there is a possibility that they can file for an exemption if there's no gain on the sale. They can actually file this form 8288B pretty much on any transactions just to see what they're doing owing. Um, with this form, once again, you, anyone can pull it off, off the IRS website. And we do have a lot of sellers or foreign nationals that have done this a gazillion times and just do it themselves. But for the most part, they really need to talk to a tax professional. If you guys, I'm, and I've seen realtors do this, I've seen realtors fill out the form for their sellers, please do not ever do that. The IRS, you want to work with somebody, um, a CPA or someone that knows who to talk to at the IRS. As we talk about the IRS in general, you know, there's a lot of uh, fraudsters that pretend they're from the IRS and they call people and they email people. IRS doesn't do that. You have to pick up a phone and try and reach someone there, thus certified mail. So really important that they were talking to a tax professional, but there is a way to kind of see what they're doing owing to reduce that withholding. With that 15%, it has to be in the IRS's hand within 20 days of closing. So when we talk about the contract, the purchase agreement, it's between buyer and seller. The FERP to section of the contract discusses you know, the withholding, the liability of the buyer, the liability of the seller. At the end of the day, this is between the buyer and seller, this, this whole FERP to thing. Title company, Kevin's group, they're acting as sort of a, it's part of the transaction, they're doing it as more of a courtesy to handle the withholding, the tax escrow, and sending it into the IRS. Um, we don't have to do it on the title end, it's really between buyer and seller. I know that sounds crazy, but that's how the tax code is written. So after you know the 19th day, that money will be sent in if we do not have anything from the IRS telling us what the seller owes. And then the seller has to go and try and collect that money from the IRS afterwards. Um, we still have to do a 1099S on the gross proceeds regardless. One of the key things is the seller has to have a tax ID number before they can do anything. They're going to need one right at the beginning. So if your sellers are foreign nationals and the, you know one of the first questions you're going to want to ask is do you have a tax ID number? Because that's going to be required for anything we're filling out anyway. They're going to need it for a, to file their tax returns and all of that. We can't close without it. So if they don't, get them on the phone with uh, Social Security Administration or have them go physically to an office, I don't even know if they're open these days, and get that tax ID number because that's going to be some time um, to get just that. So just a couple more things on the withholding. If you've got more than one seller and only one's a foreign person, we're only going to collect 50% um, of the 15% of the sales price because we can't, we're not going to penalize the domestic person. So we've got one domestic person in title with a foreign national. We're just going to collect the 15% from the 50% interest of the foreign national. If there's more than one seller and one is foreign but is deceased, the deceased interest is still count, counted as being foreign owned. So the estate of the deceased person is considered foreign, um, which means that, in, that uh, their portion would have to be um, subject to the withholding. You do not avoid the IRS with death. That's all I can tell you. So exceptions to the FERP to withholding. So FERP to withholding, keep in mind that tax escrow for anything that the seller may owe the IRS once they file their tax return for the sale of their home. But there are ways to avoid even collecting that withholding because when we start talking about the percentages of the withholding and the purchase price, that's a lot of money. So we're going to talk about the th first three exceptions. The fourth one is 1031 exchange. We have a whole class series on that. It's a very in-depth thing. 1031 exchange is technically a same day exchange. FERPTA doesn't, you can't always avoid FERPTA with it, but there are some nuances with that. 
Um, Kevin, if you're interested, we can get you set up with Sangeeta for a class on that. It's a fantastic class. But we're going to talk about the first three. We're going to talk about the buyer waiving the withholding pursuant to the personal residence exemption, the IRS issuing a withholding certificate, or the seller providing a non-foreign certification. So those are three ways we're going to talk about how, uh, I don't want to say avoid, there are exceptions to the FERPTA rule, essentially, where we don't have to do the withholding. So the first question you want to ask your seller is, are you a foreign national? The FERPTA rules only apply to a foreign national seller. Their FERPTA rules do not apply to a foreign national buyer. Foreign national buyers will eventually become foreign national sellers, so they probably want a tax ID number at that time. But for the most part, Strictly speaking about the rule, it's for foreign national sellers. So if you have a foreign national buyer, we're not worried about it at the time they're buying. It's when they go to sell, it becomes um, into play. So are you a foreign national? Who is a foreign national? It's any person other than a United States person. And this includes a non-resident alien individual, even with the tax ID number. Um, so that's pretty much the general uh, population of sellers that are foreign nationals for us because they've already gotten a tax ID number because they've already done this before and they don't live in the US. We have foreign corporations that have not elected be, to be treated as domestic corporations. So there are some IRS, um, there's a ability to, if you're a foreign corporation, to elect to be treated as domestic for certain tax reasons. Uh, once again, that's going to be a tax attorney or CPA <laughs> explaining that, but they have not elected at this point to be treated as domestic. We've got foreign partnerships, foreign trusts, foreign estates, so that goes back to someone's deceased that's a foreign person. Their estate is considered foreign under um, who's a foreign national. And then we have this thing called disregarded entities. It's where you have a sole member LLC, and the sole member of that LLC is a foreign national, but their LLC is a domestic LLC. So we've got foreign national is the sole member. They have a Florida LLC. They're trying to sell under the Florida LLC. IRS will step in and say, nope, we are going to make you the sole member as the foreign national, the seller, not the LLC. And they'll disregard that entity, the, the domestic LLC. And that actually flips both ways. So those are foreign nationals, any person other than a United States person. So who's a United States person? Obviously a US citizen, a resident alien with a green card. They have to live here. Then here's one of these fun FERPTA um, uh, little tests that you do. And once again, please, please, please do not sit down and try and figure it out if your person it meets the substantial presence test. That's why we use professionals. Uh, you screw it up, we've got problems. So, foreign person who meets a substantial presence test. This is basic, basic test. There's a lot more involved than just what I've written here. So, basically, you have to be present in the U.S. for 183 days in the current year, and then two years preceding. Once we get, you know, confirmation that they've met the substantial presence test and they're considered a United States person, we don't figure it out on the title end, you don't figure it out as a realtor, we're going to have like a professional CPA, like I said, tell us. Uh, who else is a United States person? Any domestic corporation, partnership, or legal entity. And here's that disregarded entity again. So here we've got a, um, a sole member LLC domestic person that is the sole member, and for they have a foreign um, LLC that they are the sole member of. Foreign LLC owns the property in Florida, let's say. IRS disregards the foreign LLC and says, you domestic person is the sole member, you can close on um, the property and avoid FERPTA. And then we have the foreign entity, which is elected to be treated as domestic entity. So that's that foreign corporation has elected to be treated as domestic. There's paperwork involved in that. Um, you know, we'd need proof of that. But those are a United States person. More than likely, you're going to see U.S. citizen and the resident alien with the green card for the most part. Your second question uh, is what's going to be the purchase price? And like I said, it's the purchase price, not the net proceeds that are going to drive the percentage of the withholding. So we have three brackets. We have under 300000 300,000 and one to a million and then over 1 million. Now, the first exception we're gonna talk about is this personal residence exemption. And this is gonna reduce 
or eliminate the rate of the withholding. But it all depends on what the buyer is intending to do with the property. So we're going to do a little deep dive on it in the next slide, but here's just sort of the breakdown. Does the buyer intend to use the property as a buyer's residence? Not their primary residence. It doesn't have to be homestead. It just has to be a residence. If they say yes and they elect to waive or reduce the withholding, if the sales price is less than $300,000, zero dollars is withheld from the seller. Um, if they say no on any of it, it's always going to be 15% from the sales price. If it's $300,001 to a million and they say yes, we're going to live in the property and we sign this form, 10%. Over a million, it's always 15%. There is no personal residence exemption for over a million. So let's talk about the sales price less than $300,000. Like I said, the key is what is the buyer's intent with residing on the property? So here's where it gets even crazier. Um, gotta love IRS codes. This is the personal residence exemption affidavit is something that's signed at closing and it says you know, a buyer or a member of their family, it has to be immediate member. It can't be a cousin um, or anything like that. It has to be like a parent, a child, something like that. Buyer or a member of that immediate family will occupy as a personal residence for the required period of time as stated in the personal residence exemption affidavit signed at closing. So at closing, the buyer will get a document called personal residence exemption affidavit. And they will put, um, the amount of time they plan on living on the property for the first year, the first 12 months, and then the second 12 months. The rule is, so let's say the first 12 months are like, we're going to live there six months. The second 12 months are going to live there three months. The rule then states the buyer or that family member must live in that property for at least 50% of the number of days the property is used by any person during each of the first two 12 month periods following the date of transfer. So if they put in six months that first for that first year, technically they only have to be there three months. Second year, I think I said three months, so 1.5 months. Figuring out that date and time, that is going to be the job of the buyer going to talk to a CPA and tax attorney so they understand what they're signing, what they're agreeing to. So if they're planning, you know, they're like, we're going to live there three months and they're there two days, they're basically in violation of this personal residence exemption affidavit. This form goes to the IRS. The IRS will follow up and say, oh, you didn't live there in the amount of time. And guess what? Guess who's liable now for that withholding that we should have withheld at closing, but instead the buyer said they wanted they were going to live there. The buyer is responsible for that 15%. And it does happen. I get questions all the time. How does the buy IRS know? I don't know. They look at tax returns. I mean, maybe now they're a little busy. Who knows? But they do get people all the time. And when you bought a $300,000 house and you've signed the personal residence exemption affidavit and you haven't met the rule that makes no sense in the real world, <laughs> um, you haven't met that rule of the 50% of the first two 12 months, they were, they're going to ask for that $45,000 from you. It does happen. So just be, you know, this is where it, comes down to your seller needs to go see a FERPTA professional, your buyer needs to go talk to somebody, especially when dealing with FERPTA. Like I said, a lot of attorneys, a lot of CPAs out there that know nothing about this law and will give advice because they're like, absolutely, I want to get paid. They need to go talk to a FERPTA professional and let Kevin tell you who they use or what he can do. Um, but for the most part, just keep that in mind. This is a huge liability on the buyer. They sign that personal resident exemption affidavit, seller is off the hook. I mean, seller still has to file their US tax return, but buyer is gonna be on the hook for that 15% of the sales price. Um, so with this, if the seller signs, or seller buyer signs the personal residence exemption affidavit, they fill out the amount of time they're gonna be there. We don't withhold any money from the seller. No money's paid to the IRS. Uh, seller has to still file that U.S. tax or tax return, but then all of the the liability falls on the buyer now for any money due and owing. 
If it's 300,001 to a million, there's an automatic withholding of 10% or 15% goes back to the personal residence consumption affidavit too. What is the buyer's intent? Are they going to rent it out the full time 15%? They're going to live there pursuant to the IRS minimum. It's 10%. So in that case, you know, if they've, they, um, sign the personal residence exemption affidavit, we withhold 10% from the seller, but then that buyer is gonna be liable for that 5% difference if they don't meet those requirements. So all falls back on what is the buyer going to do with the property. If it's over 1 million, 15% period, nothing's getting signed, we don't care what the buyer does with the property. IRS wants it 15 million or 15%. So that's the personal residence consumption affidavit. Um, it's just incredibly important. Your buyer doesn't have to sign it. Your buyer doesn't have to agree to waive the withholding by signing that personal residence consumption affidavit, especially if they're investors, especially if they have no interest in living in the property. But these are questions that you know need to be brought up in the beginning of a transaction. They need to be, both parties need to be talking to professionals. Um, and understanding what they're getting into or not. I know that I've seen it. A lot of sellers that are foreign nationals will put on the MLS, you know, only accepting buyers that sign the exemption. So if you are a selling agent and you have a buyer interested in the house from a foreign national, you see that, get them to a, like a FERP to tax attorney or FERP to CPA and have them understand fully what they're signing. If they plan on living there and they don't care, great. Um, but for the most part, it, you know, we live in Florida, you know, you've got a lot of second homes down here. What are they planning on doing with the property? Not a question necessarily for you to ask, a question for them to go talk to a CPA. All you need to do is tell them, ooh, FERPTA, foreign national, there's some tax withholding things, let's go get you to a professional. That's the extent of the legal advice you want to give anybody. Uh, the withholding certificate. So first ex exception was the personal residence exemption affidavit. Second exception is the withholding certificate. So this is, remember in the beginning we talked about that form 8288B. It can be filled out whenever. We hopefully, the seller is filling it out in the beginning of the transaction as we are talking about the IRS and depending on what time of the year it is. I mean, this pandemic hit, everyone's short staffed, there's limited hours, all of that fun stuff. So it may take a little longer to get this withholding certificate back. But all it is, is um, it we get a document that says, this is what the seller actually owes. And this can be a reduced amount from that 15%. It can be $0. I mean, we've seen things that, you know, we're collecting $45,000 from a withholding. We get a letter from the with, uh, IRS, it's like, no, it's only 50 bucks. So that's a big difference, $45,000 to $50. So getting that your seller like on the ball with someone early on, like, hey, let's start getting filling out this information otherwise, because you don't know if a buyer is going to sign that personal residence consumption affidavit. There's nothing that makes them agree to it. Um, they don't have to sign it, even if they sign that purchase agreement. You have to be just be conscientious of it. You know, it might get thrown on as I know there's addendums and stuff regarding it. So your buyer needs to understand what they're signing. But the withholding certificate, like I said, the seller, they're gonna go fill out this 8288B, ship it over to the IRS, and we're gonna get a withholding certificate that tells us you don't have to withhold any money or this is what you have to withhold. And it's regardless of sales price. So they can even do this for over a million. Because um, a million, like I said, 15%, we don't care what the buyer is doing with the property. But if it, if it is over a million, they can still try and get this withholding certificate so we can lessen the amount we have to collect from the seller. Uh, it takes about 90 to 120 days to process with the IRS. And that's, like I said, it varies. I've heard people get them back in four weeks. I've heard people get them back in six months. So it just depends on, A, if it's filled out properly, um, and that's why sometimes when you're using a professional that's done these FERPTAs, uh, you know, that's their job. They know where to send it. They know who to talk to. They know how to fill it out properly. It must be finalized and filed with the IRS prior to the closing date. So that's at 8288B. Um, because we do, per the law, have 20 days after closing before we send in the money to the IRS. Um, in that time frame, we could get the withholding certificate, release the money. And Kevin, I'll let you talk about how what you guys do um, at the end, you know, 
how you guys, whether you hold the money or you ship it off right away. But just note that's the rule. Um, uh, so the IRS sends back the withholding certificate letter and then the funds are released from escrow to the seller. Remember, we consider that withholding like that tax escrow for anything due and owing. So if we get a withholding certificate and we're with on the title end are holding that um, money, that withholding money, and we get that withholding certificate that says now they only get, you know, they only have to pay $2,000, we can release the rest of the funds to the seller as long as it comes from the IRS. Um, once again, title companies do that as a courtesy as part of closing. At the end of the day, it's the buyer's responsibility and liability for that withholding even though they're not holding the funds because we would probably never want the buyer to withhold or hold $45,000 of anyone's money. Um, all funds may also not be released. So the third exception is our non-foreign certification. Um, these are always signed at closing and it's amazing how many times we are sitting at a closing table and we'll flip this out and sellers like, oh no, I'm Canadian, I'm a foreign person. Um, so the seller non-foreign certification, it's, it is also given to the IRS and it's basically says, I am seller, am a, not a, I'm a non-foreign person, which means I'm a domestic person. Might not make it so difficult, but it's under oath, you know, it's notarized, all that good stuff. Um, it certifies they're not a foreign person, that they're not a disregarded entity, if it's a domestic entity or as to foreign entities that they haven't been elected to be a domestic um, corporation. On this affidavit, we're gonna need a social security number or you know, if it's a corporation tax ID number. So right away, if we don't have a social security number, it's a pretty good indication we got a foreign person on our hands. And then we're gonna have to do with the withholding. Buyer can rely on that non-foreign certification at its face value. They don't have to do any in-depth, are you sure you're not foreign? all those kind of things, they can take that document per the IRS and accept it as is unless they know that it's false or they receive notice from their seller, from the seller or the seller's agent that it was false. So that's pretty much negligence on the buyer and guess what, they're gonna be responsible for that withholding. Per FERPTA, the buyer is the statutory withholding agent, not the title company, the closing agent, the attorney. I think I've said that a thousand times and it's really important to note that because when you look at that purchase agreement, the whole contracts between buyer and seller, it doesn't say title company, you know, we're going to have you on the hook for this title company doesn't sign the purchase agreement. It's between buyer and seller. And so FERPTA has made it the buyer's um, sort of responsibility to become the statutory withholding agent. And like I said, we on the title end in closing, you know, do as part of courtesy of part of the closing because we need to make sure, you know, all parties are happy and that we're getting the money to the IRS. There's no provisions for the buyer to assign or transfer the responsibility to anyone else. So they can't say, you know what, I don't want any, I don't want this liability. You title company, can you take it on? They can't do that. It's them and the seller and that's it. So the buyer must keep the seller's non-foreign certification until the end of the fifth year after the taxable year in which a transaction occurs, or at this point, they can use a qualified substitute. And qualified substitutes are typically the attorney or title company that close the transactions because we do save our documents for seven years. So we're going to have the um, you know, seller's non-foreign certification at our fingertips if the buyer ever needs it. Uh, liability. So IRS considers the buyer the withholding agent, like I said, and if buyer fails to withhold, buyer may be held liable for the tax plus penalties and interests. So that's where we go back to, yes, the title company's holding it or holding the money in escrow until we get some sort of documentation from the IRS that this is what the seller owes, or if we don't, the money goes straight to the IRS. Because if we do not meet those timelines, and this has happened, we've had a couple, um, we've actually had a situation where a closing agent held the money to like the 18th day on behalf of the buyer, sent into the IRS, and the IRS lost the package and was trying to collect the withholding from the buyer. They don't care that the title company sent it, seller's already gone, they're focused on the buyer. And so it's really important. And this is why I'm, it's like beating a dead horse. I know, and I've, I'll say it eight more thousand times, but truly the buyer is 
the main person with the liability, even though they're technically not, they're not physically withholding the money, the title company will be holding it, but they're liable for it. Uh, according to the National Association of Realtors, if the seller provides the buyer with a non-foreign certification and the real estate agent for either the seller or buyer knows it's false, the agent must notify the buyer or the agent will be liable for that tax that should have been withheld. Title company is not liable to the IRS, but maybe have liability to buyer. And this is where we see if the title company screws up and sends in, doesn't send a complete package in and the buyer gets pinged for you know, that withholding, the IRS is going to call the buyer, not the title company, but guess who's going to call the title company, the buyer, and try and get that money back. So any party guilty of willful failure to withhold to $10,000 fine with up to five years in prison. So felony, really big um, issue with trying to avoid the IRS, as we all know. And how do you beat FERPTA? You don't. Um, red flags. So these are some of the things we look at in the title world, and the IRS does too. Quick claim deeds. So quick claim deeds generally are non-insurable deeds. Um, there's typically no consideration on them. They're, they, you know, we, we don't insure them in the title world because it's not a transaction involved in them. For example, Kevin and I could like do a quick claim deed on my neighbor's property, even though none of, neither of us have an interest in the property. There's a lot of wild deeds. It's, it's, it's some crazy stuff. And you'll see it, especially when people are trying to avoid probate, they start dating back and forth and all, it's a mess. So on the title end, when we get your purchase agreement, we're looking for the original first or the last warranty deed of record because that's an insured document. And then we look at the quick claim deeds that follow. Um, so when we see something that's a quick claim deed right before closing, that's gonna be a red flag as to what's going on here. Because what happens is sellers of foreign national, they're like, uh, I don't want to deal with FERPTA. I don't need, I don't want to deal with this withholding. Hey, good domestic friend, let me quit claim the property to you. You know, you close it and then you just send me the money. The IRS actually looks for quit claim deeds. Don't do it. It's not worth it on the title end. Like I said, we were immediately like, who are these people and why are they transferring in and out of pro like right before closing? Gifting a property is taxed at 40%. So Better to just go with the FERPTA at 15, it's a bargain. Um, false non-foreign certifications, and then don't mess around with the purchase price. So if the property is, let's say, you're trying to sell it for 320 and you're like, oh my God, now we have to withhold 10%. What if we drop it down to you know, 299 and the buyer sells a per signs a personal residence exemption affidavit, seller doesn't have to have any withholding. Don't do it. You know, when we're sending in things like um, uh, 1099s and sellers trying to file whatever, IRS looks at fair market values and things like that. We don't need everyone to get in trouble in that way. Last warning, like I said, incomplete or incorrect packages are subject to the same penalties and interest as if the payment was not made at all. So this is where, you know, things, uh, there's missing documents that are sent in. Um, or missing documents aren't sent in, the IRS will just be like, mm, we never got it. Even if they have the check or whatever they do, they're crazy. So trust me, we want to make sure that everything that we've got um, is correct. That's why we're using professionals to help us with it. And with that, um, I think that's it. So Kevin, do you want to talk about, uh, first of all, are there any questions? If you have questions, you can throw them in the chat, but I'm going to let Kevin talk about um, what they do with FERPTA on their end, you know, like, what do you want to talk about? Like when you're, uh, you know, do you have like a withhold, one of those withholding forms signed by the buyer early in the process, you know, feel free to jump in and tell us what you do. 